Mona, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. I'm very, very sorry that I can't speak in German. Um, so if I'm speaking too quickly, just tell me and I'll try to talk a little bit slower. Um, so as Julian said, my background is actually first in data and then I came to journalism rather than, I think a lot of data journalists now kind of came from journalism and then went towards data, which was definitely where, where the data blog came from. So I'm basically going to give you a bit of an overview about what the data blog is, what we do, um, how we do it, and then why I think it's so important. And then hopefully you'll have lots and lots of questions for me. Um, please make a note of my email address if any of you want to ask me any questions about anything you've heard or um, anything that you've seen on the site or just anything at all. Um, so basically, let's start off by just asking, what is data journalism? And the definition I'm giving here is a really, really basic, obvious one. It's just informing people about numbers. But who those people are is obviously really important. So I think what distinguishes us from other people is that whereas um, academics can often speak to each other, this isn't me criticising academics, but academics often speak to academics, policymakers speak to policymakers, but our, the main people that we try to reach is a non-expert audience, so it's really important for us that things are as clear as possible so that the general public can engage with the numbers and have a debate underneath them. So for us, the comments underneath our articles are really important as a way of kind of um, measuring the level of that debate that we've had. Um, so, um, and that's Informing people with numbers is actually something that The Guardian has always, always done. So the very first issue of the Manchester Guardian was published on the 5th of May, 1821. And back then, um, the news was very, very different to how it is today. Back then, all of the news on the newspaper was printed on the back, and all of the front page was all just about advertisements. So the very first thing that you saw when you picked up the newspaper in 1821 um, was an advert for a lost dog. But then on the back of the newspaper, um, we had this lovely table. And it was really, really groundbreaking for its day, because if you think about the way that data was in 1821, there were just four clergymen in, in the whole of the area, which was Manchester at the time, that collected numbers. And you had to trust those four clergymen to collect the clergymen are like a type of priest, to collect the numbers um, reliably. Um, so this source called NH, who the Manchester Guardian at the time felt was really, really reliable, um, sent them numbers on um, the number of boys and girls to receive um, a free school education. And at the time, this was like it caused a massive, massive political outrage, just these numbers, because they didn't match what the government had been saying, what these four clergymen had been saying. Um, so it shows that data has always, always been a part of what The Guardian did. Um, so if it's not data that's new, maybe it's the visualisations that are new. I know one of the other speakers already showed this, so I'm really sorry for, for showing it again, but I still think it's quite interesting. So this was, this was made by a guy called William Playfair, who I know the, the other speaker mentioned as well. Um, and I think it's interesting when you read his biography. So he was born in 1759, and, um, and this is a quote which is taken from the worst source in the world, um, Wikipedia. But um, they describe him as um, a millwright, an engineer, a draftsman, an accountant, an inventor, a silversmith, a merchant, an investment broker, an economist, a statistician, a pamphleteer, a translator, a publicist, a land speculator, a convict, a banker, an ardent royalist, an editor, a blackmailer, and a journalist. And I think that's really, really interesting. <laughs> Because I think it's actually quite similar to what data journalism is today. Not saying that we have to be all of those things, but any, I think it's really, really dangerous to focus specifically on data journalism and think that you can be the best that you can be by just doing data journalism because it's so multidisciplinary. So you have to understand your statistics properly. You have to understand visual design properly. So if you're interested in everything and you're someone who doesn't want to specialise with their life and you don't know what you want to do, then just do data journalism because you end up doing absolutely everything. Um, so this was made by him. This was um, made by a guy called Priestley. Again, it's quite interesting. It was quite groundbreaking for its day. Um, so it's basically got names that are kind of categorised according to which square you find them. I think the resolution is too bad for you to see them, but there's like Hannibal... Uh, Calisius tales, like really, really famous people in history. And the length of the line denotes how long they lived for. So this was like a very, very first bar chart. And then the dotted lines denote um, if they're not quite sure of the length of the life. And again, it just really, really changed, um, it really changed infographics of the time. I'm not going to go through all of these because I think you've probably seen quite a few and you're maybe more interested here the way that the... The Guardian does it. Again, that was shown before. Um, this is another one that was made by Maynard that showed where um, beef that went to Paris had been imported from around France. 
Um, and then this one, which I don't think has been shown yet. Um, the, the, the reason why I included this is to show that anyone can do data journalism. So this was made by a woman called Florence Nightingale. I don't know if she's as famous over here as she is in Britain. Um, but it's called Nightingale's Rose or Nightingale's Coxcomb. And what she did, and this is primary research collection as well, so she was working in military hospitals and she wanted to convince people that um, the sanitary conditions there were really, really dangerous. So everything that's blue is um, preventable deaths. Everything that's black is, is um, non-preventable deaths, so they're things that would have happened regardless of how clean the hospital is. And red are deaths from wounds, so obviously they're kind of similar to blue in that um, people wouldn't die from their wounds if the hospitals were cleaner. And she showed this to Queen Victoria, and Queen Victoria changed her policy on military hospitals. So it's, it's just interesting how it's someone who, again, isn't your traditional kind of data journalist, um, but it was highly effective in its time. Um, so now to the bit that you're probably more interested in, which is how we do um, data today. So I personally write for two sections of the website. I write for one which is called the data blog, um, and I probably spend about 70% of my time writing for the data blog. Um, and it's a mix of kind of break, almost breaking number news. So we look at um, the government's release websites and sometimes statistics are released at 9.30 a.m. in the morning and we have to have an article written about it by 11 a.m. or midday, which is obviously really, really scary because there's a massive possibility that we're just going to get things totally wrong. But that's what the comments are there for as well. So members of the public sometimes say to us, you got this wrong. Um, which is really, really valuable. Um, and sometimes we work on much longer term projects. So at the moment we're doing something about the cost of housing in Britain because it affects a lot of people and we're working with the interactive team to make something that's really, really huge and it's going to take months and months of research. Um, and the other thing that we do on the data blog as well is sometimes other desks approach us. So say the sports desk is writing a story about um, how the cost of football games has changed over the past 100 years, or the foreign desk is writing a story about drone attacks. They come to us because they know that they can trust us to kind of get the numbers right, or at least that's what we try. So, so basically that's saying that we go from two different ways. Either we start off with the numbers themselves and we have to turn that into an article or a visualisation or something to give back to our readers rather than just the pure numbers or else kind of other journalists in the newsroom come to us and they already have their story in mind and they need the numbers for it. Um, so I wanted to give you guys some examples of work that we've done and how the data blog has evolved. So Simon Rogers, the guy who you can see on the right-hand side, um, he set up the data blog in 2009. He now works as head of data at Twitter, which shows you as well like the kind of strange evolutions of a career of a, of a data journalist. Um, and when he first started out, what he tended to do, he actually launched the data blog by just publishing 100 different data sets about different things. Um, and when he first started out, you can see at the bottom of it here, it says data, public debt compared. Um, and that's just a link for any member of the public to download the data for themselves. And he'd literally just write one paragraph. So imagine there was like just hundreds and hundreds of these articles that he was writing of just one paragraph that explained what this data was about, maybe why it was important and a link to download it. Um, this is another example of a similar thing. And again, it's interesting because it's text analysis. So for us, nothing isn't data. Every single thing is data. So when our Chancellor stands up and gives a speech in Parliament, we sometimes do like a data blog that says how many times did they mention this word or how long did people clap after certain sections of his speech as well to measure kind of popularity. So this is another example of kind of a really short, here's the data and here's one paragraph about what we think it shows. Um, so as I said, we've changed a lot since then, and this is an article that I did quite recently, um, and I've included it because I think it's, um, it's kind of a good example about how it's not always really, really heavy subject matter that we do, but how sometimes these pieces do really well when they're things that is applicable to absolutely everyone. So as you can see, this one got 344 comments, which is quite a lot. It was a number one um, article on the site, I think it was read by... Um, about 90,000 people or something, which is quite good. Um, and it basically just says the caffeine content of different things. How much caffeine is there going to be if you order a red ball? How much caffeine is there in chewing gum? In everything. And this, the reason why I've included this isn't to just show one of our articles did well. It's to show that um, the importance of those comments underneath the piece. So when I launch this, and I always have to keep an eye on the comments after I've published something, um, some of the readers underneath started to say, this is a load of rubbish, um, it's no use to anyone, it only has ca caffeine content per 100 grams. But obviously you don't eat 100 grams of chewing gum and you don't necessarily have 100 grams of coffee, so we want to know like, per serving or per portion size. So I had to go back and update the post. Um, 
And that shows how, for me, someone might look at this and see this as a piece of text and see this as fundamentally different from an interactive. But for me, absolutely everything we do is interactive. They're just different types of visualisation. So this text is interactive because we have to respond to the way that people interact with it and we have to evolve the piece in response to that. Um, and this is interesting as well. So you know I said that there's a link at the bottom of the spreadsheet and everyone can go to it. It's always in Google spreadsheets. We never use Excel. Um, so this is a Google spreadsheet. Um, and as you can see, I took this screen grab at about 10 p.m. last night and there were still four people that were just looking at it, even though the piece was launched like a couple of weeks ago. So for us, this is another way of, of interacting with our readers because you can see how many people are looking at the spreadsheet. So you know how many people are just interested in the text or how many people want to find the numbers out directly for themselves. And you can also see kind of which cell they're in. So maybe sometimes I open up a spreadsheet and out of all of these, no one's interested in coffee and they've all gone to sweets. So then that tells me, okay, maybe in the future I need to write more articles about sweets. Maybe that's what people are really, really interested in. Obviously there's the traditional, not traditional, but the new traditional techniques like email and Twitter where readers get in touch with you. But that's a different level of engagement. This is a way that we can monitor how our readers are reacting to the piece without them necessarily taking the initiative to kind of get in touch with us. Um, and this is, I think this is interesting as well because, so um, we wrote a piece about um, food hygiene ratings in different restaurants around the UK. And I think this is interesting because it shows that in data journalism, the line between primary and secondary research isn't clear and it's partly because of scraping. So technically, all of the data about the hygiene rating in every single restaurant in the UK is available on the government's website. Anyone can go and see it. Um, so it's not primary research, it already exists and it's out there. But you can only type in one business name or one street or postcode. So how do you know at a national level whether our restaurants are clean or which parts of the country have clean restaurants and dirty restaurants? So I don't know how many of you are familiar with scraping, but we basically scraped this website, which is a way of just extracting all of the data and information that's in the website, and produced this map. And it's not a particularly beautiful map, it's just a fusion map. Again, you can search by name and postcode at the top there, but it gives people an opportunity. And you can't particularly see it very well here, but actually, um, once we mapped it, there was loads and loads and loads of dirty places up in Scotland, which everyone had a massive debate about that you wouldn't find if you just had that government website, unless if someone took the time to Google in, to search into it every single um, restaurant in Scotland. So, I mean, it's not particularly rewarding because it's really technical. As you can see, we've written barely anything to go with it. It's just a tool that we give back to the readers. Um, but we think it's quite an important one, even if it's not fun necessarily to, to do. Um, this is another example, and this one shows, th so I wanted to also show some examples about how we respond to information from other desks. So after Typhoon Haiyan happened, um, our responsibility, I think, in a situation like that is to give our readers extra context. So at the time, all of the media outlets were saying that the typhoon in the Philippines was the worst ever one in history. So we thought, okay, let's find out. So we did the research, and it turns out it's the fourth worst in history. That's not to like be a distraction from the humanitarian disaster or anything. It's just so that journalism kind of gets the facts correct. Um, and again, kind of published um, some maps further on down the article that showed um, wind speeds and stuff and gave a better sense of context. Because in a way, actually, saying it's the fourth worst one in history, but perhaps it has a higher death toll, also says something that's really important for readers about kind of responsiveness or about political actors' ability to kind of deal with it. Um, the other thing we did, after Typhoon Haiyan, was to look at um, aid. Um, and again, this was a scrape, so this is all data from a UN website that monitors every single donation. There's two things that are really interesting about this. One is the gap between what people promise to deliver, so um, uncommitted pledges, that's just people saying, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll like, send over three billion to the Philippines, and what's actually kind of given. So the purple bar denotes everything that's actually given or has been put in a legal text that they're bound to, they have to give it to over. And the second thing that's really interesting about this is that we didn't just map countries. So you'll see further down that the IKEA Foundation gave more money than China. And that, again, kind of prompts a bit of a debate around our readers about the nature of aid and who gives aid and who humanitarian actors are. So again, it was taking one particular disaster and giving readers more kind of background information that, that was supposed to help them. Um, so the other section of the website that I work for is a section called Reality Check. And I really like writing these. I probably spent about 20% of my time writing these. 
And basically, we try to catch people that abuse numbers. So if a politician kind of makes a sudden quote about a number and we think it seems really, really suspicious, or um, and it doesn't have to be a British politician, it can be anyone or a celebrity, or um, or even if we see like a kind of science paper and we and we think that the findings at the back are kind of suspicious, we'll publish it in this and give again give readers the chance to kind of evaluate it for themselves. So here's some more examples of how we did this. Um, the Mayor of London, quite recently, again, probably not an interesting example for many people in the, in the room, but it was really interesting from a British perspective. He gave a speech and he said that 16% of our species um, have an IQ below 85, and he was only interested in the 2% of people who had an IQ over 130. So um, I wrote this reality check. We looked at um, IQ levels. And again, sometimes, sometimes the reality check is just saying it's not necessarily a case of us providing more, more accurate data. Sometimes it's just saying, how could you possibly know that? Um, and further down, we looked at the correlation between IQ and voting patterns. Because if um, people with a lower IQ are more likely to vote, that's a really stupid political move. And equally, if people with a lower IQ are more likely to vote for him, he definitely shouldn't insult them. Um, so, and I would probably argue that people with a lower IQ are more likely to, to vote for him. But anyway, um, so, and as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be us providing more reliable data. So, um, again, like I'm sure you've had the same debate here in Austria, we've had it everywhere about um, women wearing the niqab. And we had loads and loads of politicians um, for a whole week spending hours of public broadcasting talking about how dangerous it is when women wear the niqab because they can't be really, really good doctors if they're wearing the niqab. Um, so aside from the fact that doctors wear surgical masks, so anyway, um, we decided to look at whether the amount of airtime that was spent on this, hours and hours, was justified by the facts. And our reality check basically said, we don't know how many women in this country wear it because there's no, there's no kind of legitimate data source. But, um, you know, if you work out that this percentage of the British population are Muslim, this per percentage of those are women, this percentage of them have come from countries where the niqab is worn, and kind of showed our workings at every single stage and got down to a number of three or five and said, how many of them do you think are likely to be doctors? It's still saying, look, we don't know what the numbers are, but it gives people kind of open and access and tra like transparency about the way that we've come to our conclusions. Um, the other thing that we did that was quite fun was, um, so we don't just reality check numbers, sometimes we reality check maps. I don't know what you call ginger people here. Um, we call them ginger. <laughs> or redheads. Um, and we found this map online that showed where all of the redheads are. And people loved it, like absolutely loved it. And um, we have no idea where it came from. And we really, really suspect that it is a total load of crap. Um, we found one source that said that um, it was based on a guy called, I've forgotten his name, but when we looked him up, he was an anthropologist who published his best work in 1933. Um, so again, we were quite worried. So we kind of published this, said it, was, said it was really ridiculous, but we did something that was really interesting at the end of that piece, which is, we put in a Google form, right? So we said to people, which Lindsay Lohan are you? Um, what's your hair colour? And if you are ginger, do you feel that society persecutes you? Um, and the thing that's really, really fascinating about it is, um, and again, I checked this last night, it wouldn't load properly, um, but you can see there's um, 19,046 responses if you exclude the third row, first row. So that's primary data collection. If you write your piece well enough, people will engage with it and want to give you back their data at the end of it. So you might say this is really, really stupid. You know, if you actually scroll through it, we've had, you know, we've had responses from like Slovenia to... Um, Papua New Guinea saying about like their hair colour and whether or not they, they think it's an issue. And it is, it's really, really fascinating. Like, even if, you know, this will just be something fun, but it shows you how data journalism is evolving and you write a story about the numbers and then you ask for people to give you better numbers or to give you better links or better sources and then you go back and you write something better at the end of it. So even if this is the worst thing in the world, 19,000 responses from people is surely better than like a map that was produced in 1933. So we still think it's quite interesting. Um, so I should probably be um, finishing soon. But I, 
so now I'm going to talk a little bit about our kind of methodology about how we how we do what we do. So I always prefer, um, especially if we're looking at the government statistical release, we don't like looking at the government often issues like a PDF report with it that says, look at all of these wonderful things like unemployment is falling, um, more women have fantastic jobs. So we always just ignore that and go directly to the numbers themselves. And I always try to, whenever I look at a spreadsheet, have not one theory, but at least two or three if I can. So if you only go at it with one, with one kind of mindset about this is what I think will be the case, you're, you often get what, you, what you're looking for, basically. So it's really good to have different theories about what might be in it. So once we've kind of looked at the data, um, finding the data, so again, we either... We either look at these government statistical releases which come from the one website or sometimes it's a case of kind of really difficult ages and ages and ages kind of finding, finding the right thing. Um, it can take as much as like 70% of your time sometimes to just literally find the right link or the right source. Um, and sometimes the other thing that I should mention is sometimes we do freedom of information requests. Not very often, but sometimes that's our kind of equivalent of primary, primary research other than these um, surveys. And then, I don't know if you use the same terminology over here, but we call it cleaning the data, so just getting out all of the, the rubbish. So obviously there's a big, there's a big shift between finding um, you know, statistics from the OECD and then publishing it into that Google spreadsheet that other people can use, because there's a million footnotes and um, everything's in the wrong format and the columns, don't, the columns don't quite work. And sometimes we use, I saw one of the other presenters use Google Refine, sometimes we use Google Refine to kind of reorder the data as well. Um, and then we try to notice trends, um, and then we basically check. So you kind of say to yourself, are there other sources that we can check this against and, say, and see if other sets of numbers are saying the same thing as these numbers are? And also, this sounds really, really stupid, but sometimes you just have to think, like, logically, could this possibly be the case? So we did a, a huge map on... Um, on the opening hours of GP practice, like general practitioners' surgeries all across the country. Um, and we noticed when we pulled out all of the data from the government website, some of the GP practices were open for one minute and some of them were open for 23 hours and 59 minutes. So you're like, okay, maybe not. And we realised it was like a 12-hour, 24-hour clock thing where the data had been formatted. But it's the kind of thing that you miss because if you have faith in the way that you're pulling the data out and if you have faith that this is a government, like a government site, Sometimes you don't spot things like that, so you always have to just look through and, um, and ask. And even the ones that were like open for an hour, we just picked up the phone and, and called them all, like went back to traditional techniques to ask, like, is this actually what the numbers are? Is this correct? Um, and then again, sometimes we combine data sets to make a story. So sometimes one thing might seem really, really boring and uninteresting, um, but then when you put it with something else, so I was looking at the number of pregnant women in the country that smoke across the country. And then it's interesting for something like that. Do you compare it to poverty level statistics? Do you compare it to mortality statistics to try and get a kind of sense of what that means? Um, and then we visualize it. And as I said, for, for, like a text is a form of visualization, even if it's not as pretty a one as, say, um, an infographic. Um, so for print, we often work with our graphics department in-house. Um, and we give them the numbers and we try to give them advice about how to visualise things and they don't always listen to it. Um, and then we produce a lot of our kind of interactives ourselves because the interactives team tends to work on longer term projects. So if th something has to be done really, really quickly, we use things like fusion tables, Tableau, Data Wrapper, really basic tools that will just get the job done really, really quickly. Um, and it all comes back to asking the right questions, basically. If you get that wrong, then nothing really comes out of it because you just take things at face value or you don't find the right story um, to give back to people. So, oh, okay, I don't know if this is actually going to be of interest. This is, um, um, well, I don't know if I should actually show it. So this is um, an animation that we did last year to show like what were the biggest stories of 2012 and it's got some visualisations in it that we, that we made. So I'll just, it's quite short. I'll show it to you. It's not, it's not doing the sound now. Should I just unplug it? Oh, was it not loud enough? I don't know why it's not working, the sound.
Okay, so I'm sure like any animators or graphic designers will be horrified by the quality of that. But um, it was interesting for us because A, no one on our team had ever done an animation before, and B, it was kind of an exercise to make sure that we're as integrated as possible in every single department. So producing something like this meant that I could go back to the video team and say, when you produce a video on global warming or on you know, um, anything, or on food shortages or something, actually what you need is in between your interviews to have a really short animation that visualises some of the data around that topic. And it's something that they've started to do now. And um, we actually published today a really interesting animation on um, the NSA and on security um, and privacy. So it's really good to see that even stuff like this that feels like it's a waste of time um, isn't because it influences thinking, like it influences kind of organisational change. Um, so I'm wrapping up now. So basically I wanted to talk about what makes a good data journalist. I've already said that you have to be interested in absolutely everything and feel lost and confused about your life and then you'll be an amazing data journalist. Um, you have to be really curious. Um, you have to be sceptical about numbers and I think people aren't. I think there's a different kind of... Um, there's almost a different emotional engagement with words as there is with numbers. So people read a piece of text that's been written by a journalist and they kind of think, oh, well, this journalist is from this country, they're this religion, they're writing from this perspective. But when they're faced with numbers that have come from an organisation, they don't have that same kind of sense of... It's more difficult for them to kind of understand what the potential areas of bias are. So our role is to kind of expose those and to discuss them. Um, you, have to, you still have to be quite a good writer to be a data journalist, but you also have to be a massive geek. So you have to love learning new things, learning how to code, learning how to build interactives. Um, and one thing that I didn't write there that I'm just thinking about now is actually you kind of have to be a bit sociable. So some other journalists don't engage with the comments underneath an article, partly because they're often quite offensive. I get called some horrible things underneath the article. You have people saying, oh, you know, this is so ridiculously stupid. But you have, to, you have to have a really thick skin, and even when someone insults you, kind of go back to it and say, OK, I take your point, um, maybe I am stupid, could you please send on a better source for me to kind of update the article? And it, and it, and it changes the nature of the conversation. So now, our comments underneath our pieces are actually less hostile than they are in other areas of the site, and that's because we've made an effort to kind of engage with everything that people have to say. Um, and then finally, basically, how is it changing news? So I think one thing is that it's making it less adversarial because people have a kind of common talking point rather than just talking at each other. So I'm sure you notice in like political debates, it's just this is my philosophy, this is my philosophy, and there's no kind of grounding to it. Um, I think the best data journalism at the moment, I'm sure loads and loads of you know the name Nate Silver. So um, data journalism needs to start to look forward. So it's not enough to focus on historical data and really, really up-to-date present data. We need to get better at doing forecasts and doing really honest forecasts. So saying, you know, we think this is going to happen to the economy and we think there's a 7 out of 10 chance we're going to be wrong. It still gives the public something to kind of engage with. Um, I think it's making um, news more beautiful, um, some of the infographics that are coming out of it more fun and more democratic because it gives people open access to the numbers that we used to write our pieces. So traditional journalism, sometimes they don't even cite their sources if their sources don't want to be named. Um, and even when they do cite them, sometimes you don't have the email address or the contact or, or even like the weight and the legitimacy to get in contact with these people. We just give you the numbers to do whatever you want to do with them. Um, and then basically all of this I put onto, um, this was our kind of advertising campaign. Um, and this isn't me trying to convince you about how I'm not trying to do an advertising campaign on you. And also, if I was, I wouldn't use this because it's really embarrassing that there's three letters in the, five letters in whole and seven letters in picture and it's just not proportionate. But aside from the fact that it's a really bad infographic, it's quite nice because it shows that, um, it shows that The Guardian understands that um, visualisations are a really powerful tool to kind of persuade people about stuff, even if what you're trying to persuade them is to buy the newspaper. Um, thank you very much for having me. Thanks.